What is up everyone, welcome back to the second installment of my Spider-Man review series. Of course, this is all in the lead up to Spider-Man No Way Home, which is going to be coming out for me here in the UK on the 15th of December. So we are going through and we are reviewing every single one of the live action Spider-Man films that I have not yet reviewed on this channel. And of course, today with this being the second installment, we are going to be reviewing the sequel to the highly successful 2002 film Spider-Man with Spider-Man 2, released in 2000. 2004 and directed by Sam Raimi. Of course I was very young when this film came out, I was only about four or five years old when this dropped and I did actually see this film in the cinemas albeit because I was very young I don't have as vivid a memory of you know what it was like in the cinema and the cinema experience of this because I was very young at the time. My memory of that with the Raimi series is more regarded towards Spider-Man 3 because I was a bit older when that came out. Looking back at it now the hype for this movie was incredible because of course Spider-Man 2002 the original film broke records. I think it broke records for the biggest opening weekend of any film at that time and it grossed a ridiculous amount of money. It was one of the highest grossing films ever at that time. Really kickstarted this belief that comic book movies were this thing that could be successful not just financially, but critically as well. So yeah, the hype for this film was incredibly through the roof. I was fully aware of the fact this film was coming out when I was young because I couldn't escape posters of it here in the UK. This was one of those films that I always really enjoyed when I was younger. I really enjoyed it as a Spider-Man film because of course, me being a little kid, I always enjoyed Spider-Man. So you throw a Spider-Man in anything, I was gonna say I love it anyways. But as I've gotten older and more mature, and as I start to look at films with a more critical standpoint, this has gone from just being a film that I enjoyed as a mindless young child to the point where I'm going to say this right now. This is for me in the top three comic book movies of all time. Like at the very top is The Dark Knight and then the two films that will battle it out for second and third place for me are this and Unbreakable. That is how highly I regard this film. So, so don't expect me to be one of those people that's like, oh, Spider-Man 2 is overrated. If you came here for a Spider-Man 2 fanboy love letter session, then you are in the right place. Because all I'm going to be doing for the next 20 minutes is just talking about how great this movie is. Because, my good God, I love this film. So starting off with the positives, I just have to get one thing out of the way that I really respect what this film does as a sequel. Which is that... As a sequel to a comic book film, you have one of two options. You can either go bigger and better, or focus on progressing the characters from where you left them off in the previous film. And it could have been so tempting for Sam Raimi to just go ahead and just go all out bigger and better, just try to have way more villains, way more storylines, way more characters, maybe something we might discuss for maybe what didn't work so well in Spider-Man 3. But in regards to Spider-Man 2, I think he chose the best option, which was to try and somehow, while having the stakes obviously increased in a certain way, also having this film feel way more personal. And that was just such a ballsy move to make at the time, because again, Spider-Man 2002 was an incredibly successful movie. So the fact that he decided to keep it as almost simple and low stakes as he did is something that I have to give the man credit for, because... It absolutely worked in the long run because it took what the first film did and it just progressed it in such a natural way and such an interesting way that still kept these characters interesting and still progressed these characters forward. But you also introduced new people into the film that were just as compelling as the characters we had had previously giving them motivations, fleshing them out, making them relevant to the story. And it's something that not a lot of superhero sequels would for me try to do. They would just try to go flat out bigger and better. Not this film, and it works in its favour because of that. The story of Peter as well is one in this film that I think is even better than it was in the first one. In the first film it was all about Peter learning the power of responsibility. In this one is very much the lesson of choice. Peter is stuck in this dilemma of, do I choose to be Peter Parker and try to be there for Mary Jane, try to reconnect with Harry, or do I commit to Spider-Man and be the saviour that Uncle Ben wants me to be, but at the cost of having a normal life? Am I allowed to do that? What choice do I have? What choice do I make? The film gives you such good reasons for both sides. You see the benefits of him being Spider-Man, but you see the drawbacks that it has on him with his normal life. And you see the positives of Peter trying to focus more on his normal life, but the implications that has with him not being around as Spider-Man. 
you follow Peter throughout the film, you completely understand why he feels the way that he does in that moment. The way the film just ground you in that character is just so masterful. And it's one of the reasons that we love Peter Parker as a character, because he's someone who goes through experiences that so many of us will have gone through on our lives or will go through on our lives. And the way that they portray this in the film it feels so authentic and real in a film where you've got someone who can shoot webs out of his hands or a villain who has eight limbs. And yet somehow these moments stick with me the most because they really grab you emotionally. They feel genuine and it feels real. The entire story arc that Peter goes on is absolutely fantastic. For me, this is by far my favourite version of Peter slash Spider-Man out of any of the Spider-Man films because no performance or handling of his character in any of the films has affected me or stuck with me anywhere near as much as it did in Spider-Man 2 where you truly understand this character's mindset and you truly understand his choices and the film really puts you in his shoes and then you total into the fact that it's in this crap scenario where because he chose not to be with Mary Jane at the end of the first film she is now seeing J. Jonah Jameson's son so Peter is now losing that romantic element with him and MJ because of him choosing to be Spider-Man. He's slowly drifting apart from Harry because of him taking pictures of Spider-Man and how much Harry resents Spider-Man for what he thinks he did to his father. You see him slacking education-wise and he can barely pay his bills. He is in a shit scenario and you feel it. You feel the scenario that he's in and really makes you relate to him on a way that I don't think any Spider-Man film, in my honest opinion, has since. And of course, it goes without saying that the performances all around are absolutely phenomenal. As I say, Tobey Maguire in this movie, best performance for, by him and for me personally in this role. I think he's absolutely brilliant here. Another shout out that I will mention as well in terms of the performances, a particular standout is Harry. I really like what they do with him in this one because in the first film, he's very much there as Peter's friend, but there's friction between him and his dad. The way they progress his character in this film where obviously Norman Osborn slash the Green Goblin, he died at the end of Spider-Man and now Harry has this resentment towards Spider-Man, but also in a way his best friend Peter, because he knows that Peter takes pictures of Spider-Man, and that, so that creates conflict between those two characters, and it just builds this tension up throughout the film, and you see him slowly dissolving as a person, he turns to alcohol, he's so desperate for vengeance against Spider-Man that he's willing to give up powerful substances to the main villain, just so he can take his revenge on him, and then the way that culminates with him finding out that Peter is in fact Spider-Man and it leaves you with that bombshell of him knowing that and the conflict that he feels that his best friend in his eyes betrayed him and then the tease that he could potentially become the Green Goblin with him now knowing that Norman Osborn was the Green Goblin this entire time. I love what they progressed with that and favourite scene with him by far is the scene at the party where he just lets it all out at Peter and he lets his emotions loose. That's such a great scene. Again, James Franco does such a great job in that moment. J.K. Simmons as well as J. Jonah Jameson. Just as amazing in here as he was in the original Spider-Man. Arguably for me, even better. Some of the jokes in here are just absolute classics. Like, the can, can you pay me in advance? And his response to that with his laugh. It's absolutely hysterical. Somehow found a way to make his scenes that were already funny in the first film even better in the sequel. I mean, it's J.K. Simmons. What more can I say? And another supporting character who I loved in this and is really good comedic relief, Mr. Ditkovich. Or if you don't know him by name, he's the guy that shouts at Peter for his rent money. <laughs> but yes, I love this character as well. Again, that's what Sam Raimi does. He does such a good job of just having these small roles but making them so memorable, either with the delivery of their lines or how funny or quirky they are. And Mr. Ditkovich, he is one of them. He doesn't appear in No Way Home. I am rioting in the cinema because Mr. Ditkovich deserves to be in that movie because I love him in this one and in Spider-Man 3. Of course, no discussion of Spider-Man 2's performances or the cast can really be complete without talking about Doc Ock, Otto Octavius, played, of course, brilliantly by Alfred Molina, who is terrific. This, for me, is one of my favourite villains in any comic book movie period. I think he's by far the best villain out of any of the Spider-Man films for me, because not only with the connection that he has to Peter, with him being this guy that Peter respects and is almost kind of the ideal person that Peter wants to be. He's someone that has a normal life, but he can also use his goods for the better of mankind. He has that balance, that equilibrium that 
Peter is so desperately trying to find throughout the entire film, but you also see that there's a bit of an ego to him. He's so confident in what he does that it kind of makes him blindsided to certain aspects that are just as important, but he chooses to ignore. And the way the film sets that up, and then with his transformation into Doc Ock with that terrific scene with him where they're trying to get the arms off his back, and it's like something that you'd see off Sam Raimi in the Evil Dead trilogy. I just love that scene, by the way. But Dr. Octavus as a villain, he is truly brilliant because, again, you understand him. They build an interesting connection with him and Peter. And he's not quite as over the top as, say, Green Goblin was in the last one. And so for that reason, I do find him a more compelling villain because while Willem Dafoe was definitely there chewing up the scenery, I don't think he was as complex a villain, nor did I find his relationship with Peter to have as much of an emotional payoff as the one that Peter and Dr. Octopus have in this film, for example, and the way they end off his character with him realising the error of his ways and Peter being able to talk him out of this, not just with Art May's words, but by his own advice that he gave Peter at the start of the film. Such a brilliant way to just call back and make everything full circle and him sacrificing himself, hoping that he doesn't die a monster. It's just these kind of themes and this kind of storytelling, which is just so brilliant. Again, we so rarely get this in comic book movies nowadays. That's why I just hold such nostalgia and just such fond memories for these Spider-Man films, especially this trilogy. And the emotion of this film as well is just through the roof. As I mentioned with Peter's story, you connect with this film and you connect with Peter Parker so much and you understand all the emotions that he goes through. This film has this ability to just feel so real. Again, when you've got all these crazy events happening, it's the moments with the characters and these one-on-one -on -one conversations that I found myself, in my opinion, the most gripped with throughout the entire film, which is crazy because four-year-old me, when he saw this in the cinemas, probably would have slept through these scenes. He was only here for the train fight at the end of the film. But me being an older person, getting the chance to fully understand and take in what's going on with these scenes, they're so powerful and so good at humanizing everyone in this film and there's numerous moments where the scenes with characters where i'm on the verge of tears because i care about them so much and i just admire the fact that the filmmakers bothered to have these scenes in the film you've got a scene at art may's house where peter realizes that she's struggling to pay her rent and the bills and she might be forced to get evicted soon and she tries to give him money and peter tries to reject it and she's like no i want you to take this money and she's on the verge of tears and then you've got the scene with Peter and his hallucination of Uncle Ben when he's at his absolute lowest and he wants to give up being Spider-Man. And that scene absolutely kills me every time I watch it because they've done such a good job in the first film of building up Peter as a character and his relationship and how much Uncle Ben means to him to the point where when he gets to his lowest after that party scene, which is phenomenally well done, by the way, just showing how down on his look Peter is, to get to that point where... He's with this one person who is kind of the personification of why he wants to be Spider-Man. And he rejects that. The emotion, not just, of course, with the scene itself, but just what that means in context for Peter and the whole movie. It's so brilliant. And it's just, again, those emotional beat moments and the down-to-earth moments that this film has where it lets these scenes play out. It doesn't try to force on a joke when it needs to it lets the whole scene play out again just like i said with the first film i really respect this movie for that and committing to that because it makes the movie so much more better with these scenes intact as they are but of course when we don't have these great character moments together we of course have the action sequences and whilst the, this film doesn't focus on action as much as you would probably expect a sequel to when it is here in my opinion it's brilliant all the fights between spider-man and Doc Ock are brilliant. Of course, you have the first one where they're in the bank, which is kind of just there to demonstrate what Doc Ock's arms can do and Peter slowly losing his powers, but it's the train fight, the second proper fight they have in the film, where for me, this is still the best action sequence in any Spider-Man film to date. There hasn't been anything that has topped this for me. The whole introduction that we have beforehand where Peter gets his powers, he's swinging through the city and then we have that beautiful transition shot where it goes from Spider-Man swinging through the New York skyline, through Doc Ock's lens of what he sees and he climbs up the tower, 
Holy shit, man, what a transition shot. I mean, it's so stylish, but it's so, so glorious. And then how they have this fight on the tower and it ends up on the train and just the moves and just how dynamic that action sequence is. All the different parts that they throw in with Doc Ock having these people throwing them off the train and Spider-Man having to save them while stopping Doc Ock and stopping him from hitting all these other people. And then now that culminates with him ripping the brakes off and Spider-Man has to stop the train by going at the front and trying to stop it with the power of his webs. Again, no Spider-Man movie has topped this action sequence and the rest of them throughout the film for me are just as good. They are brilliantly well done throughout here. And the implementation of CGI and the way that it's used and the way that it's used to enhance the movement and the abilities of the characters is brilliant. I think, in my opinion, it's used far better here than it was in the original film, where you had moments where it was a bit choppy. Here in Spider-Man 2, I really don't have any issues with the CGI. I think it's really well implemented throughout. And it only makes the action sequences on a whole even more brilliant to watch and even more dynamic and it only helps the action sequence in this film hold up even better 17 years later since it came out and the score of course by Danny Elfman I mentioned this briefly in the previous review but Danny Elfman's music for these two films is so iconic and if I had to choose my favorite score of his from the first two movies I would have to say this one just because I love the contrast that he brings to his score with the very dramatic moments and how emotional it is and then you have kind of this rip-roaring inspirational score when he's Spider-Man. I always think to these moments and the music and how important a role it plays in the emotions that I feel. Like when I'm watching the Uncle Ben scene or I'm watching any scene with Peter and Aunt May and the emotional heartstrings that the score pulls. I just love this score so much. It's probably my favourite out of the two just by a slim hair but still brilliant and I love the music for both of these movies. And I'm not disrespecting Christopher Young because I think his score for Spider-Man 3 is also very, very good. But it's just something special about Danny Elfman's themes and Danny Elfman's music from these first two films that is just so iconic. And whenever I hear these themes, I think of Spider-Man. And that's the power of the music that he was able to produce for these first two films. Negatives for Spider-Man 2. Um, there is none. <laughs> uh, there is none that I have. I really don't have any issues with this film. For me, that, that really hold anything back towards it. I love virtually everything about this. I know some people try to make the thing about, well, how does Peter lose his web shooters because he has depression? That makes no sense. For me, it completely makes sense with me in the context of what they're trying to go for in this film. I mean, I even remember on this recent rewatch, there's a line from Otto when he's talking to Peter. And he says, when you keep com something as complicated as love bottled up inside, it can make you sick and of course we know that Peter has these feelings for Mary Jane and how they're completely just tearing him apart from the inside and, and so that causes that mental block for his mind to be like I love this person I want to be with her I don't want to be Spider-Man and make that causes him to completely lose his ability to have his organic web shooters like that explanation on its own was something that I already had for this film and then I saw that line and I'm just like the film explains it why do people have an issue with this? So yeah, I personally have never ever subscribed to that camp of criticism towards this film. Another criticism that people try to tend towards this movie is Mary Jane and her love triangle with her Peter and John Jameson. I actually don't mind this. I do like this art because once again, I understand why Mary Jane would go in this direction because she poured her heart out to Peter at the end of the last film and he basically just turned around and said, no, I'm sorry. I can't be with you. So she moves on. She's tired of his bullshit. She's tired of him just constantly living up to promises and not being able to make them. And so I do understand why she would get to that point of where she would think, okay, maybe I have to move on. Even though she has these feelings for Peter deep down, I do like how it plays out. And the whole climax of that with how Mary Jane, of course, ends up choosing Peter over John after the whole final battle where she finds out that Peter is indeed Spider-Man, something we've been building up to for two films, and she makes that choice of deciding, do you know what, I understand the dangers that you have as Spider-Man, but I'm willing to take that chance because I love you. I love the whole conclusion to that, and I really like how that love triangle storyline plays out throughout the film to push Peter and MJ's story, and how it ends up concluding with the two of them finally getting together. I've never really seen it as an issue with this film. 
and I, again I, I enjoy that aspect of the story because of where it leaves these characters off at the end of the film it comes to a natural conclusion and one that I found very satisfying given the journey that we had been through all the way from that first film up until now so of course final verdict for Spider-Man 2 based on how I have been fanboying about this film for the past god knows how long I think 25 minutes judging by my watch yeah, you can tell, I love this film with a passion, so this is going to be one of the easiest scores I will give to any film that I'm going to review on here in recent times, it is of course a 10 out of 10. There is no question about it, it's honestly just one of those films that I watch without fail every single year, and watching it this recent time in the build up to No Way Home just makes my love for this film grow even more, because of just how special it is and how I have to admit, they just don't make comic book movies like this anymore. Comic book films with this heart, the slight element of campiness, but having this realism to it that makes it so emotional, whilst having these really interesting characters and amazing action sequences. For me, like I said earlier, this is the best Spider-Man film. This is in my top three superhero movies of all time. I very much doubt it is going to get displaced from there anytime soon, because of just how much this film stood with me how much this film means to me, how much it's stuck with me, and just how much of an influence this has not just had on Spider-Man as a character, but on comic book movies in general. One of those films that when everyone looks at for greatest comic book or just movie sequels in general, they look at this film because of how magnificent it is, and long may that continue, because I fucking love this movie. So thank you all very much for watching my review on Spider-Man 2, of course. Next installment of this review series is going to be me reviewing Spider-Man 3, which is going to be a very interesting discussion because it is a film that has gone very much up and down in my estimations over the years as to what I think about it. It's kind of had a bit of a resurgence in popularity over the last few years. Am I one of those people? Well, you'll just have to watch the video to find out. But in the meantime, I want to thank you all very much for watching my review for Spider-Man 2. Please leave a like on the video and make sure to leave in the comment section what you think about this film. Do you agree with me that it is a 10 out of 10 basically masterpiece of a superhero movie or do you have different opinions? I'd love to hear them down below. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so and you enjoy what you see and you want to see more and I'll hope to see you all again next time for my review of Spider-Man 3. See you then.